Shows of Starling, Countries Without Borders, by John Miles, artwork by Various, in memory of Ian Langford, 1956-2017. to 2017. Joseph is born in a woodpecker nest in the famous Moscow Botanical Gardens. He is one of five brothers and sisters, each born from a beautiful blue-green egg at the bottom of a hollow in a birch tree. The great spotted woodpecker has been drilling for several weeks to get the nest site ready for his lady. She will lay their eggs on the wood chips that were created when the hole was dug. But Joseph's dad has other ideas and starts to bring dried grass to the hole while the woodpecker is away. Once the nest lining has been made, the woodpeckers give up on the hole and have to start again somewhere else in the gardens. These gardens are perfect for the starlings as they contain a nesting site, short grass for finding food and the added bonus of many people feeding them. Many benches are placed in the gardens for the people of Moscow to sit and enjoy the lovely scenery, the smell of the flowers, the beauty of the trees and not forgetting the wildlife enjoying life together in the habitat provided for them. The trees act as an absorbent of noise and pollution from this big city. The people of Moscow love to get away to relax here from the hustle and bustle. They often bring their food to eat so there are always scraps for the starlings. They fly down and race the pigeons and mix thrushes to these morsels. Starlings are seen as a sign of spring due to their migration to and from Russia's cold winters. Joseph is growing up fast. Several times a day, food is brought into the nest hole and he has to be the first to beat his brothers and sisters to the treat. He opens his mouth wide, showing his bright red throat gape which stimulates his mum or dad to place the food in it. Once the food has been taken, Joseph turns around and offers his parents a fecal sack from his bottom. This is his waste from digesting previous food and off it goes. As a result, the nest site is kept clean and safe from bugs. In no time, the young starlings are clambering up the steep sides of the nest hole to the entrance. One by one, in their juvenile plumage, they pop out of the hole and onto, into the branches of the tree, flapping their wings and calling for food. Both parents bring them food. In front of the tree is a patch of short grass where both parents are no probing with their beaks. Juicy leather jackets, the young of crane flies are found. The leather jackets are feeding on the roots of the grass, so the starlings are doing a great job for the gardeners and in the wider countryside for the farmers. Starling are very much the birds working for the people. Soon, all five young are on the grass begging for these grubs. This is an important learning curve for the young as they can now observe their parents and see how food is found. In a few days, all five are feeding themselves by probing in the grass. Their bills are sensitive to movement under the grass of the leather jackets, worms and other insects as they move around to feed. Joseph is soon realising where these creatures are and is having more success finding his food here. His parents are moving further and further from the old nest until they reach the benches where the people are sitting. Now there are taste, new tastes to try, such as bread and margarine thrown out to the birds. Joseph has to be fast at grabbing such delights. He has to compete with speedy pigeons and thrushes. Bathing in a puddle along with preening, cleaning, their new feathers to keep them in good condition is a new task if they want to fly. More and more starlings are now gathering together as these birds are better in a group. They like to be together. This is very much like the Russian man Joseph Stalin, who was involved in the creation of communism in Russia and the Soviet Union. He brought the people together as one with no social division. These starlings are far safer in a large group. They can find food more easily 
and are safer from predators as there are more eyes to see the danger coming towards them. Joseph no longer has his parents, brothers and sisters close to him. He now works as a member of this flock and even roosts, sleeps in a large tree in the garden with them. Soon the weather in Moscow is turning colder and the ground will freeze, making it difficult for Joseph and his flock to find food. This is the signal for his flock to join an even bigger flock and start on their journey to find new feeding areas. The flock moves west out of Russia, through Belarus and into Poland. Yet again the ground is beginning to freeze so the flock continues west over Germany until they find food near a marshland close to Tonda just inside Denmark. Here there are starlings from Sweden, Norway, Estonia and even Finland. The rich agricultural land offers lots of food and there is a large reed bed to roost in. The number of starlings is now growing, now going to the roost is over one million. Many birds of prey, such as falcons, hawks and harriers, are drawn to feed on this large flock. Joseph is safe if he keeps with the great flock, swirling in the sky like thunderclouds, murmuration, turning the air black with their presence. Some birds of prey are covered in the droppings from these birds, making them heavy and unable to fly. They drop to the ground to clean themselves. Unlucky ones even drop into water by the reed bed and drown. What an amazing defensive system. Soon, even here, this roost is suffering from the cold and lack of food due to the frost. This large flock is now breaking up with birds heading south and Joseph's flock heading west across north, the North Sea to Britain. Joseph has never flown so far over water before, but even with the winds and rain, the flock struggles in, onto Suffolk coast, roosting in another reed bed at a place called Minsmere. This is a nature reserve set up by the RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. And as Joseph will find out, not all birds are protected with some falling as prey to predators. The flock has lost a lot of their fat reserves after such a flight, so once on land, they feed heavily for several days to make up for the crossing of the North Sea. With a small flock than the one in Denmark, Joseph has to duck and dive when it comes to roosting. Birds of prey like marsh harriers, peregrines and sparrowhawks attack the flock. These flock moves are a way of upsetting the birds of prey so they cannot concentrate on catching an individual bird in the flock. When the flock turns at speed, even the colour of the flock can change from pale and back to what looks like black. The adult starlings have an amazing iridescent colour when seen in good light. People come before dusk to the reserve to watch this murmuration spectacle. When the starlings dive low, even the sound of all those wings is heard. Often a spray of droppings catch some of the crowd. Even when the flock is settled in the reed bed, there is chance of attacks from below. The worst offender is the bittern, with its camouflaged body resembling the reeds. Its long, thin bill suddenly thrusts into the mass of sleeping birds, taking one from the many. This is followed by a much smaller bird called the water ale, which sounds like a pig when it calls in the reeds. It will feed on the older birds which died during the night from the long migration and dropped into the bottom of the reed bed. As dawn breaks, Joseph is glad to be back on the wing and out to the new feeding ground. This information is passed to the flock during the night by other starlings. These starlings have enjoyed the rich pickings the day before. This is yet another good reason to live in a flock most of the year. This does not work during the breeding season when the nest sites are all spread around an area. This is due to the lack of nest holes in trees or man-made structures. Back in Russia, even Joseph Stalin encouraged the Russian people to make nest boxes to house a starling as he knew they were feeding on pest species such as the leather jackets, saving the Russian people's crops.
The flock will stay around the area of Minsmere as long as the weather remains mild, making it easy to feed. Murmurations continue. But if hard weather comes across the North Sea, then the flock will move on, perhaps down to the southwest of England, or if the cold follows them, even across the English Channel into France or across the Bay of Biscay to Spain. They may even join up with starlings they met in Denmark. As winter turns to spring with lighter and warmer days, even Joseph, with a new set of adult feathers, will feel the urge to breed. He will start to sing for a mate from the flock. He even mimics some of the bird calls, such as those of Peru and Golden Plover, which he has heard around this reserve. Once the warm winds arrive, the flock will say goodbye to Minsmere and head back east across the North Sea. They will make their way overland back to Moscow with members of the flock peeling off as they pass their natural home. Joseph, back in Moscow, will sing again with his new mate. The whole process of breeding continues. Who knows, he may even pick the famous parliament building called the Kremlin to make his nest, if he can find a decent hole in the stonework or in one of those man-made nest boxes. Ian Langford, 1956 to 2017. You've been listening to Joseph Starling, Countries Without Borders, by John Miles, an artwork by Various, in memory of Ian Langford, 1956 to 2017.